eventually one day I will find this prototype map guitar that has the toggle switch in a cool location. Little did I know it was that episode that would find it for me. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. Now, I own many guitars that I am ultra proud of in my collection. Things like the Aldo Nova, the Dragon Les Paul, the Brazilian Rosewood Custom and Elegant, along with many other guitars that I'm piecing together for my future museum. But today, we document the tale of how I found my number one guitar, the map guitar. We're not talking about all these that show up on Reverb quite often. We're talking the one that was used on the poster, on all the promotional materials. And in all these years searching for it, it was hidden in probably the most obvious place. So I was looking for this map guitar for years, and occasionally I would plug it on the show that I'm looking for that particular one, and I would get leads from people saying, hey, I just saw one listed on Reverb. They didn't understand that I was looking for this specific one because it's different from all the rest. It's got the toggle switch up by main, whereas the other ones were in different locations. So this tale starts just like any other. Hey Austin, I saw your new video saying you were wanting a Gibson map prototype. If you're actually looking to get one, I think I may know where to get it. Let me know. I've received many messages like this. Usually it just ends in heartbreak because it's a regular map. So I always reiterate, yes, I'm specifically looking for the one used in the promo shots. And he tells me, okay, I'll check and get back with you tomorrow, most likely. Well, we go from November 10th to almost a week later, and he's asking me if I could send a picture of the example I'm looking for. So at this point, I was just thinking, nah, nah, it's another one of these false leads. It's not what I want, but I decided to play along because you never know who's going to find the guitar that you're looking for. And if you teach them, they might find it. So I provided this photo, circled the toggle switch to tell him what I was looking for, sent it on, wasn't expecting to hear back from him. But his next message said, oh great, well I work at a guitar shop and watch your channel and just happened to see a video of you mentioning the guitar and then the very next day the guitar shows up to his shop. And then he says he's got two of them that are in on consignment and one looks like the prototype I might be looking for. And then he offered to send some photos. So at this point I'm still feeling very skeptical but hoping and praying that might be what I'm looking for because I felt he was dragging it out a bit too much not giving me photos. But as soon as I saw it, I knew it was the one. Look at Texas. There's a line right here, and there's a line right there. You also have a single circular wear pattern in the front leading knob. And then I later found out he works at Carter Vintage in Nashville and was being consigned to them by the family of the guy who carved these for Gibson, the celebrated James Hutchins. Needless to say, I bought two map guitars that day. It truly was fate that led me here. A viewer of the show reached out, told me about this poster on some sketchy website, and I happened to buy it, happened to unbox it on the show that that employee just happened to be seeing. The guitar walks into the shop almost the exact same day, and here we go. We're making history for this special July 4th episode. I'm so excited to see this thing. Ah, there it is. It's, it's so beautiful. Now, unfortunately, it's a little bit more rough than I was expecting it to be when we shared some photos back and forth, but it kind of helps paint the story of the very first promotional one. Oh, this is just surreal to finally have this in my hands, but this one has such a story to it. It has a pretty big chunky neck. It actually reminds me of like some mid 60s melody makers, how they start off maybe a little bit slimmer right here, but then it gets like ultra beefy up here. But you can see the construction of this is rather crude. So it was probably the first Gibson version one. As we were talking about earlier, it's on all the pamphlets and even inside the pamphlet here with Orville Gibson. It's even plastered here on the back. You find it in a bunch of spec sheets. I mean, they used it on clothing back in the day. That's right. This is a true 80s t-shirt I found. They're still making pins that say that today. It's just always somewhere in Gibson advertising. It was the birth of the whole American made world played phrase. And this is that exact guitar that everyone has seen. So I was telling you, it's kind of crude and it's mainly because of the back plates. Nobody's ever seen the back of this thing. It's the front that's popular, but they're not even recessed into the body. Same thing is true for our toggle switch cover here. I'd imagine they decided not to put them up here because it's a lot of work doing an extra cavity. Why don't we just make this one a little bit longer and put it down here? Who cares if it's not as functional? They only did this one to be pretty for a photo shoot. That's why they didn't care about what it looked like on the back. And for your non-believers out there, you might say, hey, the color looks a little bit different than it did in the photo. Are you sure that's the original one? 
I gotta remember, this thing was taken around to a bunch of guitar shows used as a promo type thing, so the lacquer has aged. So that's why you can use key details, like I was telling you earlier how Texas has a line right here and then another one right there. Depending on the angle that you view it from, it actually has like a Chateauian effect to it. You can see that same line right there and there. It's got the toggle switch location that we all know about. Now someone has changed our orientation of it at one point in time, but we still got the diamond posi lock in the same position. And we've got the flip out winding tuners that we could just barely see. But here's that one additional feature I haven't told you about yet. You see right there on the first fret, there's like a dirt or scuff mark on it. Still there. The neck is pretty hastily glued in there. Looks like they were going to put like a strap button or something right there, but then decided to fill it in. I mean, you can tell it's actually a pancake body to get the thickness that they need. That's also true on later production ones. But now that we know that this is the first promotional Gibson branded one made, let's learn about the history of why this thing even exists in the first place. Our story actually begins with the Epiphone branding. Gibson bought Epiphone back in the late 50s and continued to make guitars under their branding for quite some time. However, let's paint the landscape. The 70s and 80s were full of copycats from Japan and other overseas countries, and they were really hurting Gibson and Fender and other manufacturers. However, in 1982, Gibson gets the idea, let's make the Epiphones in the United States again. So they introduced the Epiphone Spirit model. It's kind of like a Les Paul Double Cut Junior-ish like shape, and then they also had something called the Special, which was an SG. They had these cool combination wrap tail pieces, and that's when this comes into play. They made the Epiphone map guitars as more of a promotional thing. They had a big contest where if you go to a dealer store and you try one of the new Epiphone USA models, you'd be entered into a contest where you could get to go to Kalamazoo for a day and three nights in Nashville. Probably tour the Gibson plants would be my guess. But to Gibson and Epiphone's surprise, those doofy promo map guitars were actually a big hit because everybody was all, yeah, American made USA, and we still are yet today. Now, when we say big hit, it's more so people were like, hey, those are kind of cool. I like them rather than yes, I need to buy that guitar because honestly, the USA Epiphones, they didn't last too long, 1982 through 1983. So after the success of the Epiphone map guitars, that's when they decided, OK, let's do some Gibson branded versions. So is this the very first map guitar made? I don't think so, but it's probably the very first Gibson one. It's not actually marked a prototype on the back of the headstock. So we can at least know for sure that this was the promo guitar. But let me tell you guys, this is actually bigger than most map guitars, and I didn't realize it until I bought that second one. That's right, America's birthday this year gets double the map guitars. So this one has a slightly different layout, and it's going to look a little bit more finished. And let me tell you, this actually feels like it has a real finish on it, unlike our other one. You're going to see a lot of differences, like what I was just telling you, the body is actually smaller. You can tell that this one only has three knobs on it and a toggle switch up here. Here you go. You can see just how much longer this one is. It's also a lot heavier. And you also see the traditional pancake construction having a small layer of maple in between <laughs> than just joining two pieces of mahogany together. The edges are a little bit more finely milled. You're really just seeing how crude the prototype slash promo one is. Further looking at them side by side, you can actually tell the whole orientation of the guitar is different. Look how the pickups are centered within the American body on the promo one, whereas the production ones was shifted just slightly. This also helps illustrate how different the controls were laid out too. And now look at the fine details of the body. Up here, you've got additional ridges taken out of it, whereas it's more smooth on the other one. Michigan has an additional cut in where they decide to smooth that out on production. You've also got some more of that down here by Louisiana. This one over here is actually legitimately marked a prototype with absolutely no other serialization on this. However, I have seen one guy claiming that he has like eight or nine prototypes. So <laughs> there, there might be a considerable amount of these prototypes out here. Also note that the heel is very traditional here, whereas over on our poster child, it's not so good. So in that sense, we can actually tell that this is a much thicker guitar. We'll get measurements all over on the workbench, though. We can also see we've got a volute over here, and this one does not have one. So now I think we need to talk about all the different versions of these things. There's so many variations on these map guitars, even in the original era that they were created. First, let's talk about layouts. We've already learned about the wrap tail piece bridge combination. That is on most of them. However, not all of them. For example, here's a Gibson branded one from 1984 that has the two pneumatic stop bar tailpiece set up. And also notice you only have three controls and the toggle switch is moved here versus this version having our toggle switch all the way out here in California-ish. 
But the biggest thing to know is that most of the map guitars have maple necks. Sometimes if you're lucky you can find some flame figuring in that neck too. The majority that you run across will be made in Kalamazoo and have that maple neck. However, not all of them. Again, here's that one we saw with the modified control layout. It appears those ones are crafted with mahogany necks. The next thing to talk about are their headstocks. The majority of them are plain, they just say Gibson and Mother of Pearl. However, you can also find some that have the crown on the headstock. Don't even get me started on all the different tuners they used on these things. For the bulk majority, you're just going to find some sort of a natural finish showing off the wood grain. I've also at least seen one cherry sunburst version, but that was an epiphone. However, it's said that nine of them exist in the Stars and Stripes finish. You could also find this in Explorers in this era. If anybody has a stop bar variety, let me know. And even though that nine number is talked about all the time, there's like five of them for sale right now, so <laughs> I just find it hard to believe that there are really that few in that color scheme. You'll find similar variations within the Epiphone branded ones as well. In fact, some of the Epiphones that could not sell, they took them back and rebranded them as Gibsons. Although I've yet to see a map guitar that that's happened to, but you do find that on Spirits occasionally. So that's kind of a crash course of what to expect. Your four knob layout with your toggle switch over here, maple neck, and your three knob style with your toggle switch in this area with the mahogany neck. So knowing what we know now, this was probably the prototype for this version of the map guitar that had the mahogany neck and the new control layout. So with that, I would assume the neck on these fancy finished ones to be mahogany. Most of them are a satin to a semi-satin finish. However, the one in this photo is clearly all gloss. So you've got finish variations, you've got headstock variations, you've got control layout variations, and you've got neck construction material variations. And wouldn't you know it, you've got Texas variations too. Now this was a custom order for Billy Gibbons. You can recap the first time I saw that thing in this episode. But that one technically predates the map guitars and might, just might have influenced them to do the map guitars in the future. However, Randy Leonard was able to confirm for me that the Scorpions actually had a custom crafted Brazil guitar too that was birthed in the original map era guitars. However, he's never seen it surface again, so it must be in one of the members of Scorpion's collections. We can only hope to one day see it. So that pretty much recaps the original era, however these have been reissued, which is perhaps the cheapest and least patriotic way to purchase one of these. So they utilized the three knob style with your toggle switch, however they opted to still use the maple neck, but these were made in China, so not quite as good as the original run. But if you got a thousand bucks burning a hole in your pocket and you want to get in on the fun, they're out there. And if you do want to buy one of these to play and gig out, be very careful. This can break off with a good ding. Florida has already broken off on this one. It had to be glued back on. But in the late 90s, they did make a few more of these, like this cool one. It's a slightly different Stars and Stripes, and we got the cool star inlays on the fretboard. You also have a star on the headstock, and the back is a beautiful white. This one was made in 2001 because a 9-11 was a tribute to America, and it has a traditional flag on it with the star inlays and a fancy blue back. Same story on this one, but we've got the concentric swirl flag design. It's definitely one of the more out there ones, and it also has a dark blue color. But ever since Hutchins retired, I'm not personally aware of any more map guitars being made. I think Gibson decided to let that be his thing. So the guy who carved all these map guitars, his name is James Hutchins. He worked in both of the Gibson plants, starting in 1963 in the Kalamazoo years, all the way ending in 2008 in Nashville. So he is the guy who carved these things, but he did almost everything within Gibson at one point in time. Where he ended up in the twilight years of his employment at Gibson, he was the carved top manager. We're talking things like the really fancy, elegant L5s. You'll see his name in a bunch of those. And the very last map guitar that he created has a really cool quilt top. It's currently in Craig Brody's collection. He's a dealer down in Florida. This one's cool for the story. His is cool because of the beauty. So now we got to talk about the desirability of these things. People ask crazy money all the time, but unless you're a guitar store owner that wants to put it up in your shop to create some draw and attention, a conversation piece, or maybe you play a lot of 4th of July gigs and you want a themed guitar, you don't really want one of these things. So they can be kind of a tough sell. So wait till you can get a good deal because outside of marked prototypes and the poster child and like the last one made and other cool ones, they generally don't hold a lot of crazy value. Now at the time of recording, Recording, there's a good handful that have sat for over a year <laughs> and these might be your asking prices however this is what recent sales figures show and I'm pretty sure this was the one that was new old stock with the original box and mint condition which had sold the previous year for like only 2500 
So for the rest of today's review and demo, I'm going to focus on my poster child, the guitar I will never sell. You could tell the original family didn't want to part with it because they had held on to it for 12 years after his passing, but whatever made them sell it, I'm glad it's in my collection because a lot of people are going to see this thing now. And if you guys are really interested, we can do an in-depth documentation on the prototype back there on another patriotic holiday. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and throw the United States of America on the workbench. Oh boy, I just, I find it so hard to believe this thing is finally on my workbench. So, what pickups are in here? I was expecting Tim Shaw PAFs, however, what I found was probably just whatever was sitting there as spare parts. You can see one of the screws is actually missing out of our base plates. I honestly don't care enough to break the original solder joints to see are these late 70s T-tops or even maybe even mid 70s because we don't have any type of date stamp. Usually the Tim Shaws would have a stamp. It could just be that he took them off the production before they got stamped, or they've wiped off over time. But the bridge pickup is the exact same thing, no date stamps. Bridge pickup is on the lower side, 7.1k ohms. The neck is also about the same. And then the middle position, 3.55. Because usually Tim Shaws and T-Tops, they range between 7.2 and 7.6, so this is just slightly on the lower side. While we're here, we might as well take a look at our pickup cavities. So this is the neck route. It's short neck tenon, technically. The routes are actually looking pretty good in this as far as having some sort of a machine do them. However, our long drill run here definitely looks a little bit more makeshift in style <laughs> once you really start to look at those routes. And it looks like there was a bit of an uh-oh right here where they put the screw in the wrong starting place and then he fixed it. This bridge pickup route is very tight. The neck pickup's a little bit tricky too. But this was really cool to see. There's a little bit of fading going on here. So yes, it would have matched the original poster color. But what's really strange is I, I don't even know if there's a finish on this guitar. I'm sure he used like at least a sealer coat, but like if you go up and sniff this, it just smells like mahogany. If there is something on it, it is incredibly light. But unfortunately, Hutch is no longer with us, so I, I can't get his detail take on it. And I, I'm so sad about that, but I'm glad I can carry on its legacy for a little bit. Bridge and tailpiece time. Take a look at what we got here, my friends. Sustain sisters. That's this slightly larger insert within the body. Usually a regular one will be a bit smaller. They're brass on the inside. They give you better sustain. We do not have them on the bridge though. But the bridge is just our regular Schaller made one of the era. It says made in Germany on the side. I never realized this before. The bridge is on backwards in the poster. Look, you don't see the intonation screws on the bottom. So if you're going to leave a comment telling me to put it the historically correct way, this is one of those rare times where I'm going to leave it the way it was. And we've got that regular full weight tailpiece with the correct casting marks for this era. Now our control layout. Those are definitely original style knobs. This is right before they switched what they make them out of, so they still age. But it's neck volume, neck tone, bridge volume, bridge tone. And honestly, from a gigging perspective, I could see how that could get confusing and you might hit your wrong one. But let's just take a second to appreciate the edges of this guitar. Thankfully, this one has not been broken anywhere, but we've got plenty of nicks and dings, such as right here on the corner, to be expected. But there we can see double layer of mahogany, no maple in between, and all these intricate carvings. They didn't have to go as crazy as they did on these, but they did. There's a nice ding up here. Some dings up here by Canada. And we'll take a look up along the west coast to see if there's any erosion by the ocean. But then we hit our strap button. I like how it's slightly recessed into the body by necessity, not necessarily because he probably wanted to. Just the way it fits into the body there. And then we get to our output jack, which seems to have been corrected from when it was like sticking all the way out. I think I'll leave that alone, but if you noticed, as much as it bugs me, I did have to move the toggle switch to poster positioning. Our switch tip is like oddly shaven down in some areas. <laughs> Not sure what the story is on that. But the south is in pretty good condition. Texas has a small ding, and miraculously, Florida is still attached. As far as how the tops held up over the years, you've got a couple of light dings and impressions in this general area, but nothing too crazy. Moving on from our mahogany body, we've got the straight up mahogany neck and rosewood fretboard. Now this is another thing I did not touch upon. This one has binding. Most of the original run ones do not. So that's kind of another special feature of this one that unless you know all the nitty gritty details, you just don't realize that's something else that is pretty special. But it's got our standard 24 3 quarter inch scale length. Although I personally measure a 14 inch fretboard radius. 
There's 12 just for reference. You can tell there's a little bit of space in that. And that is definitely a homemade bone nut, not what you would normally see on a Gibson product. But let's see the specs that they just randomly slapped on this thing. So yeah, there we go. Just like I was talking about that thin Melody Maker style neck, 1.57 inch nut width. And it stays quite skinny at 1.99. But our first fret neck depth, 0.87. And I told you they got chonky, 1.06 almost. Yeah, that's a big neck towards the upper registers. There's that neck profile at the first fret and the 12th fret. You can see it gets a lot wider, although this is a bit deceiving of how chunky it gets. And now we're headstock. I know what you're thinking, Trogly, it's so dirty. Why don't you clean it up? It's not dirty though. There's definitely not a super clear coat over top of it. That's probably why they didn't feature the headstock too predominantly in that photo. This light area to me actually looks like he might have had a tuner on it at one point in time that impressed it and changed the color a bit. But of course we have the cool flip out winding tuners. They called them the crank. You could also buy aftermarket heads, but I don't currently have a set of those in my collection. They flip in and out. It's basically a built-in peg winder, makes string changes fast and handy. Nowadays, if you got one of the winder guns, they're not too useful unless you're not on your workbench, but they're really cool. A nice piece of Gibson history. But our truss rod is in good shape and functions. We've got the mahogany neck on this one, which is a rarity. And the cover is exactly what I expected. It's got some scratches and some light aging. So now what you're probably curious about is how much bigger is this than all the other production ones? I took some measurements. So from the tallest area right here, all the way to the bottom, I measured 20 and a half inches. Whereas this guy over here, I only got 20 and a quarter inches. So it's really not that much longer. The biggest difference was actually how wide the guitar is. So from this point to the end of Texas over here, I got 12 and a quarter inches. Whereas over here, I only got 11.4. So it's almost an inch wider. Our other dimension is the body thickness. This is just like a Les Paul. It's a full two inches thick. Whereas this one is one and five eighths inches. So three eighths inch thicker on our poster child. But let me tell you, when it's solid mahogany, that adds up. So they really changed the dimensions here. That's why I'm wondering, did the Gibson version actually come first? I know the history books say the Epiphone models did. That's why I was kind of hoping I'd find some dates in here or something first map guitar ever made. But the other thing might just be, they thought those tiny ones didn't look good enough for a poster, so they had him hastily make one that's larger. And now we move on to the back. I'm not sure if you guys saw this earlier. If you get it in the light, you can still see the planing marks, is what I would assume that is. They didn't bother fine sanding the back of this because it wasn't going to show in the photo shoot. In fact, it really wouldn't surprise me if this never even had back plates until a later date. That might explain why A, they sit proud, and B, they don't actually even cover all the route. There's a small area poking through right there. And they're clearly not the regular Gibson quality of back plates. And on top of that, these are not even the style of screws that they were using in the Gibson factory at that time. Especially not these tiny ones. But wait till you see these pot codes. 1978, 42nd week. This one over here is 1978, 25th week. Now we could go all conspiracy theory and be like, hey, this was actually created in 1978, so it technically predates the Texas one. Now, everything about this just screams, hey, we've got some scrap wood here. Make us a promo guitar. <laughs> That's bigger. Maybe somebody else who is still with us remembers the tale of this one, but I'm pretty sure this was made in 82. We've also got this interesting wood grain line running down here. It's not a crack. But then I saw this. Ah, this is a multi-pieced body. So they had to glue another slab of wood right here to get the Florida and Texas extremities. And that is what then carved and made those lines I was talking about earlier, at least the big one right there. I would have never known that that was a seam line had I not looked at the back though. That other one that makes it look like the sorter hat, that's just in the wood grain though. But now, ladies and gentlemen, the reason why none of the other ones have the toggle switch up here. I was always curious why they abandoned that, and it's because the dimensions just aren't right. So they've crammed this three-way toggle in here, but do you see what they did to our contacts? They had to bend them out of the way, and they had to route more wood out of the cavity on the edges to get the thing to fit. 
So in a production sense, they wouldn't want to bend them all up and have to do hand routes and stuff like that. So they at least would have had to enlarge this a half inch. And at that point, you're just getting too close to the edges. They're going to snap. I mean, it's already a prone area to begin with. And then to route it even further to have a lip to put the plate on, it just wouldn't work. That's why they threw them all down here. Our neck definitely has some sort of a light finish on it. It's either that or the light coating that they have over this has just kind of buffed into a semi-gloss over the years of being used. It's probably more so that. But things like the heel feel just as raw as the back. And I really think they should have just left the heel giant to form to the rest of the guitar rather than this. But there's that now famous splotch stain on the binding. You've actually got quite a bit of that on the base side of the neck as well. That's not something that I think you would clean off, it's just tooling marks. I guess now that I think about it, the crank tuners were kinda new at this point, so maybe it wasn't just all parts he had in his desk. He wanted to use some cool stuff too. But you've got some nice patina worked up on these tuners. And there we go, made in USA stamp, but no traditional serial number or prototype stamp. But now it's blacklight time. So far, it seems the fact that this didn't have any type of finish seems to hold true. The knobs glow the way that they normally do, as does our binding and inlays. So we must have some sort of a light lacquer over top of here, and that definitely makes sense based on what we could see on it. But the back is definitely looking bare, but there's a very light glow. So maybe they did just spray the neck a little bit because they knew there would be a lot of contact with somebody's hands here. And interestingly enough, it looks like our screws have lacquer over top of them. All said and done, the United States is 8 pounds, 13.1 ounces. Let's go ahead, plug it in, and finally hear how this one sounds. All right, so I went to play this, and uh, yeah, I didn't notice there's not a top strap button. <laughs> I thought it was rather peculiar when I first got this that this particular screw was not sank in all the way, and now I realize why. That's what we're using as a strap button. <laughs> Totally safe. So clean tones are fun. The bridge pickup, I would like a little bit more output on it, but it is actually pretty low, so I could just raise it up. However, I think you'll find the distorted tones work pretty well with it as is. So let's get into that now. <laughs>
Oh man, that was a lot of fun playing some American themed things on one of these. I mean, what else are you gonna play on this? How does it feel to play? It's not the most comfortable guitar in the world, and that's because this prototype is actually a little bit more bumpy and rigid along the edges. I don't know if you've noticed that. The actual production ones, the edges are just a little bit softer, so it's not too bad. Like, it could use a slight arm contour right here to be a little bit more comfy. However, now that I play a production one, it feels so small in comparison. I don't like it as much. And something about the unfinished vibe of this one just really jives it makes it really resonant but as far as tuning stability i mean it was okay i had to constantly tweak it the actions maybe a little bit too low in the upper fretting registers but it plays just fine as is i wasn't expecting this to necessarily be groundbreaking because as we discovered today it was probably just thrown together to take this photo but i'm glad he kept it for as many years as he did and it finally ended up in my home. So if you're interested in being the next owner of this one, nah, just kidding. Even if you offered me a million bucks, this is one of those guitars that's just worth more than money to me. It's the map guitar, the one that everyone has seen and has been used in everything Gibson related that says American made world played. It is a legacy piece and one day you will see it in my museum. So thank you everybody for making this possible. In a roundabout ways, there's a bunch of people that made it happen. And all this time it was hiding in probably one of the most obvious places. All right, troglodytes, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.